Good morning, guys. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. How are you all doing? <coughs> Please excuse my voice. Got around. We were doing some fajitas yesterday on the grill. We got around a little too much smoke. <coughs> um, this morning, we're going to be reading out of Genesis 41. For the ill-favored and lean-fleshed kind did eat up the seven well-favored and fat kind. And this is one of the reasons why um, I read the New King James primarily, because a lot of those words that we don't know what they actually are. Um, are put in a terms that we use today, so it's easier to understand what they're talking about. People hear the word kind, they have no idea what it is. It's just, it's cows, it's bovine. So in the New King James, verse 4 says, And the ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven fine-looking and fat cows. So Pharaoh awoke. He's having a dream. Let's go up here. Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dream. Then it came to pass, verse 1, at the end of two full years, that Pharaoh had a dream, and behold, he stood by the river. Suddenly there came up out of the river seven cows, fine-looking and fat, and they fed in the meadow. Then behold, seven other cows came up after them out of the river, ugly and gaunt, and stood by the other cows on the bank of the river. And the ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven fine-looking and fat cows. So Pharaoh awoke. I remember years ago, um, at least two people have told me about some dreams that they've had. This was long before I was doing what I'm doing now. <coughs> and uh, they were telling me about dreams that were very similar in what was going on here. It didn't involve cows. It involved other stuff. Um, but thinking back, the details they gave were very similar to this dream. And so I'm wondering if, if we can go through and find all the dreams in the Bible and then, <coughs> excuse me, look at the interpretation. We might actually get some better answers for some of our dreams. I'm telling you, you can find everything you need in the Bible. You just got to be willing to read it. Verse 5, he slept and dreamed a second time, and suddenly seven heads of grain came up on one stalk, plump and good. Then behold, seven thin heads blighted by, <clears throat> by the east wind sprang up after them. <clears throat> and the seven thin heads devoured the seven plump and full heads. So Pharaoh awoke, and indeed it was a dream. Now it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled. And he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. And Pharaoh told them his dream. But there was no one who could interpret them for Pharaoh. <clears throat> there we go. <clears throat> uh, verse 9, Then the chief butler spoke to Pharaoh, saying, I remember my faults this day. When Pharaoh was angry with his servant and put me in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, both me and the chief baker, we each had a dream in one night, he and I. Each of us dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream. Now there was a young Hebrew man with us there, a servant of the captain of the guard. And this is where Joseph had gotten at that point. And we told him and he interpreted our dreams for us. To each man he interpreted according to his own dream. And it came to pass, just as he interpreted for us, so it happened. He restored me to my office, and he hanged him. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him quickly out of the dungeon. And he shaved, changed his clothing, and came to Pharaoh. When Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. But I have heard it said of you that you can understand a dream and interpret it. So Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Behold, in my dream I stood on the bank of the river. Suddenly seven cows came up out of the river, fine-looking and fat, and they fed in the meadow. Then behold, seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly and gaunt. Such ugliness as I have never seen in the land of Egypt. These are some pretty ugly cows. And the gaunt and ugly cows ate up the first seven, uh, the fat cows. When they had eaten them up, no one would have known that they had eaten them, for they were just as ugly as in the beginning. So I awoke. Also I saw in a dream, and suddenly seven heads came up on one stalk, full and good. Then behold, seven heads withered thin and blighted, and the east wind sprang up after them, and the thin heads devoured the seven good heads. So I told this to the magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. 
And the reason why I'm reading further, because this is actually kind of important. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, verse 25, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good heads are seven years. The dreams are one. And the seven thin and ugly cows, which came up after them, are seven years. And the seven empty heads blighted by the east wind are seven years of famine. This is the thing which I have spoken to Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Indeed, seven years of great plenty will come throughout all the land of Egypt. But after them, seven years of famine will arise, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine will deplete the land. So the plenty will not be known in the land because of the famine following, for it will be very severe. And the dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. Notice the key thing here. The dream was uh, repeated to Pharaoh twice, which means he had the dream three times. God does that. Do it. He does things in threes. Not 3.33 on your clock in the morning, but he does things. He shows things in threes. So it's important to pay attention. Uh, and then it goes on from there. Now, the reason why I did that is because the devotion, I think, is going to get into what that dream means. Because it involves, um, I think it, this is going to involve our lives and how we live them. Pharaoh's dream has too often been my waking experience. My days of sloth have ruinously destroyed all that I had achieved in times of zealous industry. My seasons of coldness have frozen all the genial glow of my periods. <clears throat> of my periods of fervency and enthusiasm, and my fits of worldliness have thrown me back from my advances in the divine life. I had need to beware of lean prayers, lean praises, lean duties, and lean experiences, for these will eat up the fat of my comfort and peace. Basically, if you don't do anything involving what you've been given to do, there's going to be a problem. Now, sometimes you can't help it. Sometimes there's things that get in the way. But the whole idea behind this is, is that we don't want to make, we want to make sure that any, any issues that we have, any, any bad time, aren't a direct result of our actions. Because we're the only ones to blame. And so what we want to make sure we do is that we're always doing what we should be doing. And what is that? Get up, take care of the house when it needs it. Get up, take care of your job when it needs it. Get up, do all the duties, the things you have to do. Get up and live your life. Just because the rapture is about to happen, we don't give up on those things. We get up, we go do what we need to do. Hopefully, if my sinus is clear up today, I got to go out and take the front tires off my zero turn mower because they're not they're not keeping holding air. I found a great tire sealer that I'm trying out, so I've got to fix them so they hold air because I'm not able to use the mower. Plus, the battery went bad, so I got to put a battery. I got to do these things. I am in horrible pain. My left shoulder is killing me. I got a muscle locked up in my neck on the same side. I got an old PT injury from the army in my right lower back that's been giving me fits for months now. But I still have to go do these things. They still have to happen. <coughs> because if I neglect them, what happens? The grass can't get mowed and the mower just sits there being wasted, doing nothing. If I neglect prayer for never so short a time, I lose all the spirituality to which I had attained. We don't want to withdraw from the things that are godly. We don't want to, want to withdraw from the spiritual things, just like we don't want to withdraw from the physical things we have to do, because they're important. If I need to be doing prayer, we do morning and evening devotion, morning and evening sacrifice, because we should be. But if I neglect those things, what happens? If I'm so messed up, and there's been multiple times throughout the last four and a half years that I have, that I literally have not been able to put out a video. I, I I know it. It bugs me. I hate it. But there are times where there's circumstances beyond my control. If I have the ability to do it, and I mean, most people with what I'm dealing with right now would not, hey guys, I'm not feeling good. If I'm able to do it, I have to do it. So if we're able to get into our prayer like we should, we, we need to do it because neglecting it, you know, and it's funny because 
if everything's going good, you feel good, you got peace, you got joy, everything's great. And then you, so you kind of pull back, uh, I'm going to rest now, I'm going to lay back on it. You, you're not in your prayers, you're not talking with the Lord, you're not reading your Bible. What happens? You start to go backwards. That stuff starts to fade away because you're not staying in close communion with the Lord. It's important for us to stay in close communion with him. Because then all the good stuff and all the good times are not eaten up by all the lean ones. Just like in Pharaoh's dream. If I neglect prayer for never so short a time, I lose all the spirituality to which I had attained. If I draw no fresh supplies from heaven, the old corn in my granary is soon consumed by the famine which rages in my soul. When the caterpillars of indifference, the canker worms of worldliness, and the palmer worms of self-indulgence lay my heart completely desolate and make my soul to languish, all my former fruitfulness and growth and grace avails me nothing, whatever. And so we need to constantly be work. You don't ever just plant a garden and walk away and hope it makes it. You go out there and you work that garden. We've got one going. We go out there. We work that garden. If you don't work with it, nothing comes out of it. The whole idea of growing in grace is to do it from a standpoint of being purposeful in what we do, not just hoping it's going to work out or not just standing by and letting it. I, I get this from a lot of people over the years where they're just like, oh, I don't have to worry about nothing now. Jesus has got me wrong. You don't have to worry about your salvation because Jesus takes care of that. And you don't, but you still have to work on your sanctification. You still have to abide within what's happening. You still have to grow. And it's going to take a little bit of effort on your part. Remember, salvation is something completely different from sanctification. Your salvation is by Christ alone. It's all him. But your sanctification requires some effort from you. And this is where people miss the mark. This is where people don't understand because they can't separate the two. This is why they say people like me are front-loading, back-loading, top-loading, bottom-loading, side-loading works. Because they don't understand your salvation stands all alone. That's by itself. It's done, finished. You don't have to worry about that no more. The Lord's got you taken care of on that. But the life you live after that is the one you need to be paying attention to. And this is where the instructions in the Bible correct our understanding on this and give us the things that we need to do. Show us the things we're supposed to deal with, things we're supposed to avoid, things we're supposed to attain to. And all the uh, prophets and the apostles give us all these writings telling us, guys, here, do this. Guys, here, do that. It's all for the examples so we would know what we should be doing or what we shouldn't be doing. The Bible doesn't tell you to flee sexual immorality unless it wants you to, he wants you to flee sexual immorality. What is the word flee? It's throwing your hands up in the air and running the opposite direction. Flee, run away. You flee with extra flee. Get away from that stuff. Okay, that requires effort on our part. There is some effort you're going to have to put into this life that you live as a Christian. The Bible tells us this. He tells us that you're going to be saved for good works. I mean, it's not rocket science. It's easy to figure out. But when we neglect both th those things, what happens? I've witnessed it happen. I've seen channels come on and they're talking all this smack and then they, then they, then they disappear. Or they devolve into some of the most disgusting displays of worldliness. Everybody wonders what happened. Well, because they neglected... They neglected the godly life they're supposed to be living and instead got into the other things and it ate up all the good stuff that happened. And so we have to work within what he's giving us. Just like I, I have to maintain equipment. I have to maintain my home. I have to maintain what I've got. Something that I have to do for my uh, sanctification is I have to maintain my sanctification. How do I do that? Because a lot of people right away are going to buck up against this. Okay, but how do I do that? Prayer. Examining myself. Seeing if I'm bearing fruit. Humbling myself. Changing things that I see and I know I shouldn't be doing. Making adjustments. Going to the Lord with these things. Do you go to the Lord in prayer? Or do you just sit back and go, the Lord's got me. The prayer is just going to happen magically. No, you go to the Lord in prayer. I mean, it seems like they, they think that they're living off the government when it comes to this stuff. Oh, the government does all that stuff for me. I get my food stamps and everything. I don't have to work. 
No, that's not what you. That's not what we're told to do in the Bible. See, they don't understand these scriptures. They don't want to have to realize that they have some kind of responsibility that they have to make. It, it takes effort to walk in the truth. You don't just magically do it after you get born again. The Lord gives you a great deal of help with this. But you, it just doesn't magically happen. You must walk in the truth. And this is what he's referring to here. We need to we need to do our due diligence like we're supposed to. Be a doer of the word. Doer is an action. Let's see. Where am I at? Uh, here we go. How anxious should I be to have no lean flesh days, no ill-favored hours? If every day I journey toward the goal of my desires, I should soon reach it. But backsliding leaves me still far off from the prize of my high calling and robs me of the advances which I had so laboriously made. If you strive for a long time and suddenly stop striving, what happens? You're going to go backwards. And the Lord won't let you go to the point that you can be lost. I mean, at that point, he'll probably just take you home and say, okay, well, you know, I'm not going to let you go that far. But why would we do that to ourselves when we know the truth? Get up and move. If you're if you're sitting down and a truck is coming at you, you don't sit there and hope the truck's going to veer off. Oh, it's okay. The Lord's got this. No, you're going to tempt the Lord. He's going to let that truck run you right over. You're going to stand up there and go, oh, Lord, what happened? You're the one that sat in front of the truck and didn't move when you saw it coming. Well, you think I'm just going to carry you around in a lawn chair? No. Get up and do something. The only way in which all my days can be as the fat kind is to feed them in the right meadow, to spend them with the Lord in his service, in his company, in his fear, and in his way. Notice it's all about him. Why should not every year be richer than the past in love, in usefulness, and joy? You want to be useful to the Lord? Get up and do something. I am near the celestial hills. I have had more experience of my Lord and should be more like him. O Lord, keep far from me the curse of leanness of soul. Let me not, let me not have to cry, my leanness, my leanness, woe unto me. But may I be well fed and nourished in thy house, that I may praise thy name. What he's saying is, you need to make every effort, just like the Bible says, to enter by the narrow gate. How do we do that? Read the Bible. Read the Bible and do what it says. Be obedient to the word. So many people today are denying this and you can see the result of it. You can see that whatever happened in the beginning, they've lost it all because it's been eaten up by famine. It's been eaten up by a famine of the truth, famine of the word. And so they're, they get into this states of hatefulness. I just had to deal with a couple of them the last two days. They get in these states of, of depression, these states of being lost. And so they just keep walking and the, they're walking right next to all the food and, you know, like hikers, hikers go out, they go hiking, they go too far. They don't do any research. They don't make sure they're armed with a need. And then they go out there searching for them because they're missing forever. And then they find their body leaning up against a tree dead. And they're sitting in the middle of a field that's full of food. Like almost everything on the growing on the ground is edible. You know, it's like you didn't, you died for lack when you were standing right next to fullness. And a lot of Christians end up in this boat because they've got that Bible sitting there, but they're on their computer being a keyboard warrior, just typing away, putting out all these paragraphs and all this diatribe. And they just keep going further and further down and starving. And so they go and they strive to try to get something and they can't. And they're laying, they're, they're right next to the field of plenty, the Bible. If they would get back into the Bible, they would realize what they're doing and stop it and change. Like the post I put up on the community tab last night. Hope you guys saw that. If you didn't go see it, it's clear. This is how we grow by learning what the Bible says. This is how we grow is by doing what he told us to do. Living the example he set for us to live. I shared that verse in there. Jesus himself said it. I've set you the example to live by. If we do that, spiritually, we will always have plenty. If we don't do that, spiritually, we'll be bankrupt. 
Jesus said, I, I t tell you to buy from me the choice gold so that you'll be rich spiritually, spiritual gold. How do we do that? Right here. Right here in this word. But just like when we neglect the things of daily life and we start to lose it all and we start to become broke and end up on the streets like so many people have because they just decided not to do it anymore. The same thing happens when we do it spiritually. So what we what do we have to do? In, in the world, we have to work. We have to do things. We have to provide for ourselves. Spiritually, we must do the same thing. We must go and do something. What is that doing? Do the word. Simple. The Bible says be a doer of the word. Do the word. If it tells you do this, do that. If it tells you don't do this, don't do that. Simple. Because if we don't, we only have us to blame. The Lord couldn't have made it any easier. He gave us an entire book, access to all the world's knowledge. You can literally sit down and in an hour, come up with all the evidence you need to prove anything you need to prove. And that's doing detailed research. It's that easy to find it. It's that simple. And we can walk in truth, knowing exactly what he wants us to do. If we would but do the work. The problem is people don't want to do the work. It's too much effort to open that cover. It's too much effort to look up and see what those scriptures say. And it's too much effort to put them into practice. And what a terrible state we're in as a church that this is what we think is the right way to do things. That doesn't make sense. But we see the evidence of it. Look how nasty they are to each other. Look how hateful people are to, people are to each other. And like the post last night, it says very clearly, if you say you love the brethren and then yet do all these terrible things, you don't love the brethren. You're a liar, like John says. But those things that you're doing to the brethren, you're doing to Christ because we are all made in the image of God. So what you do to another person, believer or unbeliever, you do to him. You do to Christ. More and more, I'm starting to understand that sheep and goats judgment and what it's talking about. It's very clear. If I'm kind to another person in any way, I'm being kind to Christ. I'm glorifying him. If I'm unkind to somebody in any way, I'm being unkind to Christ. And so this changes how I'm going to do things and how I'm going to do what this word says. Because I need to do it from a place of integrity, humility, and a place from knowledge of the truth of knowing that I need to act a certain way towards the people around me. Not, not letting them get away with stuff, but holding them accountable. Not just patting them on the back and telling them everything's okay, but telling them the truth, even if it bothers them or hurts their feelings. Because if I say I have love for my fellow man, I need to show it. So just like we do all the things that we do in this world for normal everyday survival physically, we need to do those same things for our normal everyday spirituality. Prayer, supplication, walking in truth, learning the truth by reading the Bible, believing, glorifying, praising, giving thanks. These things are very important. These are the fruit of our lips. You want to bear fruit? That's a great way to start. One of the best fruits you can bear is the fruit of your lips. Give praise to God. Give thanks to God. Glorify God. Worship God. Speak truth to your brethren. Speak peace. It's a great way to bear good fruit. But so many today can't even bring themselves to do that. Instead, the first comment I got on that community post last night was somebody literally proving everything I said in that post. And the first thing they did, instead of looking at it, reading at it, and seeing if they fit in that, or that, that had anything to do with them, and it has everything to do with every one of us, they immediately accused me. You literally prove me right. You literally prove the scripture is true. See, that's a person that's warped and sinning. That's a person we're not supposed to deal with. First and second admonition have nothing to do with them. They're warped and they're sinning. The Lord will deal with them. If we're going to say we're believers, 
Let us show it. And you know what? Those of us that are showing it, we're reaping the rewards of it. In our lives, everything is changing within our households, within our lives. The people around us are being affected. You know who you are. You've been sharing your testimonies. And it's amazing. You know what's going on because you're seeing it with your own eyes. That's just one great indicator to know that you're doing it right. Because we, we have this horrible habit of constantly, am I in the right standing with the Lord? No, no. Do you have faith? Well, yeah, but I mean, no, no, no. it says without faith, it's impossible to please the Lord. You got to have faith first. Everything else falls into place after that. Are you doing what the Bible tells you to do? Well, you already messed up because you just immediately, well, your answer needed to be no, but I'm praying to the Lord to show me. Your answer should be, I'm doing the best I can. Your answer should be, I'm reading the word and learning it and following it. And Jesus is teaching me. Because we're all in need of teaching. We're all in need of being humble. We're all in need of growing. And so if we don't want those good years to be eaten up, those good spiritual years, by lean spiritual years, let's take that one step, turn around, go back to the Lord and deal with this stuff. Let's lay it all at his feet. Lord, what do I do now? Show me what to do and I'll do it. Teach me, show me, lead me. And then let him run the show. And you will be amazed. You will be amazed at the difference it'll make in your peace, in your joy, and in everything going on in your life. It literally will completely rearrange things around you. And suddenly you'll realize that you're living in a bubble, that you're hedged around about, that you're protected. And then it starts to click, I need to keep doing this because this works. And this glorifies him. And then you're amazed. And you're like, how did I not realize this before? Well, that's because that's the world teaches us to do the opposite. So let us glorify our Lord, not only in this morning's devotion and prayer, but all day, every day, by our normal everyday actions, by the things we do and don't do, the things we say and don't say, and by how we treat others. H-E-B was horribly busy yesterday. The guy that was working the register and the bagger, they were they were going after because there was a lot of people in there. They were they were really, really getting after us. I said, hey, you guys, I know you guys don't get this often or at all, but I, I appreciate what you guys are doing here. You guys are providing an incredible service and y'all are working really hard. I appreciate you guys. Y'all as as clerks like this get get ignored. Thank you for working so hard and, and for doing this. The dude was blown away. Because nobody even thinks to thank the person that's waiting on them behind the counter. This is exactly what I'm talking about. It's a little thing, but it can make a big hit. And then the guy, the bagger, he worked so much harder and faster for us when I, I thanked him. I said, really appreciate you guys working hard like you do. You know, I know y'all are busy and everything. But just Sometimes you guys and people you know, don't look at y'all as people and you get lost in the shuffle. Well, I, I see you and I thank you for what you do. Motivation. It's that kind of kindness that has this wonderful effect on others, but it's also that kind of kindness that works within your spiritual growth. Not only do they benefit, but you benefit too. And what's amazing is you glorify the Lord by doing something so simple, so simple. And it's something you don't ever hardly see anybody do anymore. So I've made a personal decision to humble myself and to make it my effort to look for those opportunities when I can give somebody a, a comment and, and a compliment and, and to encourage them out in public. Because what I do to them, I'm doing to Christ. Just like the post last night on the community tab. <coughs> that's, that's me. I'm going to be a doer of the word. So everybody has to make that own personal decision in their own lives, in their own walk with the Lord. So I encourage you, consider. Consider what I said in that post last night. Consider what we're saying here, what we're talking about here. 
because you cannot believe the amount of peace that will wash over you when you take that step to do that to somebody else because then you realize what you just did and it becomes addicting being kind to somebody that you don't know becomes addicting not when you're syrupy sweet about it but when you're just being genuine being truthful being real with somebody hey i'm not just saying this to stroke your ego but i really do appreciate what you're doing because you guys don't get you don't you guys don't get recognized you guys aren't seen you're just somebody here punching buttons to most people you're not that to me you're a hard working individual i've worked this kind of job i know what this entails and i appreciate you and what you do something so simple could be so profound and it gets lost in the shuffle see i don't want to lose all these good fat years that the lord has given me spiritually by being lazy and just writing other people off and and not even paying attention to the people around me because that's where my investment is is in the people around me is it going to work out perfectly nope but it's not meant to but I can tell you this from personal experience. You acknowledging, even your husband or your wife, even your kids, you acknowledging them shows them you love and care for them. You taking a moment to let them know you see them and you're paying attention. With all the phones and computers, people ignore everything. People just completely ignore, I mean, I've gone to friends' houses and everybody's sitting around texting each other on the couch, sitting in the same room. I'm like, are y'all for real? You talk to each other. What's the matter with you? I've, I left. I'm like, I ain't gonna sit here and do this. Y'all crazy. <laughs> Even put it on TV like it's normal. It's not. You taking that time Husbands, I can tell you, if your wife is doing a bunch of stuff, if your wife is busy, there's a lot going on, and you haven't done much, even if you're hurting, you going in and cleaning up the kitchen will put go a long way in showing your wife you appreciate what she does because you're willing to go clean up after her. Now, I'm, I'm not saying this just, just to kiss her posterior. I'm saying this because... You showing her you appreciate her. You do that by, by that action. Your children. Do you need to get anything from the store? Even if you're adult children. Hey, I'm going to the store. Do you need to go? Is there anything that you that you need? Like, you know what? Let's go wander around the stores or something like that. And just talk with them and interact with them. Whether they're children or adults. Either way. You would be amazed at how that will build those spiritual connections between people. And in doing so, you glorify the Lord because you're showing somebody kindness and love. And it's been there right in front of us this whole time. How have we missed it? I'm trying to show everybody because I'm personally experiencing this. And I can tell you, it, to great effect, it has become a major positive to the point that I, I crave it. Because I enjoy the, the response that I get from it. And I know that what I'm doing is correct because the Bible tells us to do these things. So guys, just consider what I say and go prove it with Scripture. You don't have to believe me. Prove it with Scripture. Don't lose all these wonderful fat years that the Lord has given us spiritually by being lazy and getting into these lean years spiritually. And you wonder why you're struggling spiritually? Maybe that's the reason. Try it. See what you think. I, I, look. It works great for me. I'm positive it'll work for everybody else. Try it. See what you think. You might just might be amazed. The little bit of effort you put out will bring great rewards. And the Bible even talks about these things being attributed to certain crowns. It's a win-win, guys. It's a win-win. Father, we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ to give you praise, honor, and glory, and to lift you up and to sing praises unto your holy name. <coughs> Father, thank you for this holy word, and thank you for this devotion. 
Lord, I am amazed at how such simple things can have such a profound effect on not even our own well-being and spirituality, but on those around us. And we take it for granted, the people that do things for us, the people in our household, the, the things that go on, we take all of it for granted, not realizing that just a small bit of effort on our part can change the whole atmosphere in the corner of a grocery store. Uh, kindness by looking at somebody and smiling can change the attitude of several people. Doing something for someone unprompted can have great effect on letting them know you care about them. Taking your word and putting it into practice in our everyday lives to whatever degree we can find to do glorifies you. And Lord, like I put on that post last night, what we do to others, we're doing to you. You made that clear. So why would we be so nasty to other people? And I see Christians do this and there's no reason for that. But why would we do that? Why would we risk losing the, the fat years like in Pharaoh's dream? Why would we risk losing the, the good years of spiritual growth to laziness and to these years of of leanness to these years of, of hatefulness, of walking away spiritually, not getting into the word. Lord, you've made this message perfectly clear since day one of doing this. When I started this in January of 2019, day one, tell them, read, read, read the Bible. And Lord, what I found is that when I read your Bible, these things become natural. I start to learn that these are the things I should be doing. And I start to see the result of them. And I start to realize this is how we walk the narrow path. This is how we pass through the narrow gate is by doing your word in this life. If we want to be able to pay our bills and to feed our families and keep the house cool or hot and keep the cars running and keep everything going, we must do work of some kind. If we want to be spiritually fed, spiritually full, spiritually true, if we want to be spiritually right, we need to be doing the work of reading the word and then putting it into practice in our daily lives. There's a direct correlation between these. The fat years are the years we're spiritual. The years we're all in. The lean years are the years we step away. You don't step away from us. We step away from you. Why do we do that to ourselves? But the world blinds us to what we're doing. And teaches us to look to ourselves for self-help, quote-unquote. Uh, no, it's not about self. It's about you. So, Lord, I want to bring it back to you. I want to go back to what your word says. I want to get everybody and lean them this way, push them this way, and point them the right direction. Back to your word where we know the spiritual life is. Where we know the spiritual food is. And then take that word, take what we've been fed with, and go share it with others. Thereby glorifying you. Thereby bringing honor to your name. And we know that these also lead to reward in heaven. Because your Bible tells us they do. So if we know the truth, why would we do the opposite of that? And yet that's what we see a lot of today. My post yesterday, Lord, you, you inspired that. I, I looked up the verses. I put it in there. And the first person to comment was somebody doing exactly the opposite of what they should have been doing. And literally, by their one single sentence, proved what everything that post said. Proved exactly the point I was trying to make. Amazing. What's wrong with people? Lord, the world is the biggest problem, but we're also the problem because we're lazy. We don't want to do those things. We don't want to have to put out any effort. And Lord, my goal is, and I pray that this is happening your way, is to get everybody to start to realize the benefits of doing it your way. You told us, you gave us the book. You've done everything that you can do and need to do short of taking us and grabbing us by the head and spinning us around and pushing us the right direction. And I think sometimes you do that too. We've got to look at this and go, I'm going to do this. Just like we have to make effort to make money in the world. We got to make effort to walk a right way. But, Father, we need you to teach us, we need you to correct us, and we need you to turn us around. Because we're dense, we're slow, and we're hard-headed, stiff-necked. Father, make us to serve you in this way, in any way that glorifies you. Make us to read this word and, and it get into our heart 
And so that when we're out in public and we don't have the Bible right in front of us, it's a natural thing for us to do some things your way. It's a natural thing for us to be those kind of people. And so we come out of those lean years and get into these fat years, these years of plenty, but then realize we need to stay there. We need to keep doing what we're doing. Keep doing what you told us to do. Keep doing it your way because it is to your glory and it is to our benefit to do it that way. And so, Father, I pray this message reaches every heart that hears it. And I pray that those hearts are able to share it with someone else and it reaches their heart. And on and on and on and create the snowball effect of this wave going out. Of this wonderful message being shared and people going, you know what? It makes sense. I, I want I want to do that. And they go and they do that. And then they, they see, the because the, it's not only looking at the other person and seeing how happy you just made them by some small gesture of kindness, but you feel that rush from the Holy Spirit for that stuff because you realize, oh man, this is what we should be doing. And suddenly we become the light. We become the salt. The light and salt of the earth. And you told us, be light, be salt. Because it is your light shining from within us. Amazing. Perfect. Goes right along with exactly what we should be doing. Father, make this to be true because I know it is your word and it's, it's what it says. Make us to do this. But Lord, I pray everybody proves this. So that there's no doubt in their mind that I'm just giving them a story or just making this up and giving it to them. But they'll see it in your word and go, okay, there it is. You know what, Lord? I'm going to do this. Not because Mr. Christian is trying to, to prompt me or goad me into it, but because your word says to do it. And I want to glorify you. I want to please you. I want to do things your way because your way works best. Because the spiritual growth, the spiritual, amazing spiritual feeding that comes from that is beyond comparison to anything else. Father, thank you. Thank you that we have this word to go to, but I thank you that we have this platform to share this. And I thank you that now at the end of the age that we have this opportunity to, to correct so many bad actions, correct so many bad ideas, to humble ourselves, but then to change the dynamic of what everybody goes with. I mean, look at society today. It's horrible. <coughs> France is about to completely collapse. <laughs> but instead, suddenly to be a guiding light to the world. Guys, this is the truth. This is what we should be. And Lord, there are so many people out there. I have started to run into little videos here and there of people out in the streets fighting the good fight, sharing the truth. Lord, I pray your blessing upon them. Your, I pray your blessing upon them in all things good and all things godly and in their mission to prove the truth and to glorify you in doing good to others. Thank you, Father, for your mercy and grace. Thank you for your great love. Thank you for your free gift of salvation. In Jesus' name, we bless you, praise you, honor you, and glorify you. And in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, amen. Guys, thank you for joining me for Morning Devotion. It's so simple, but you'll never know until you try it yourself. You'll never know the benefits of doing his word to any degree unless you go read it, think about it, put it into practice, and purposefully do it suddenly you'll start to realize, wait a minute, this is the right way to do things. You're not always going to get the result you want, but you live knowing you're doing the right thing. That's its own reward. And then you realize, I, you know what? Why haven't I done this like this before? This makes more sense. And suddenly it becomes a natural thing for you to do. You become a naturally a nice person. Naturally, you become a blessing to the people around you. Naturally, you become a doer of the word and it becomes second nature to do things God's way. And people suddenly are like, what happened to you, man? You've changed. No, I didn't change. God changed me. He changed me. He showed me something that I had never seen before. Yet it's always been there. And now I realize there's something much better than this life. And I've got my name on the rolls of heaven. You can too. You want to hear a story? <laughs> and then you tell them the gospel. I can't even, I can't express this properly. And of course you can't see my face right now. I can't express this. But you won't know until you try. When you try, then you'll realize it. And what it should do is it should send you further into the word to learn more 
about what he wants from us, to learn more about what his desires are for us, and to learn more about what the goal is in this life that we're living. And when you start to learn those finer details, you start to put them in practice in the world, and you start to realize we've been doing it wrong all this time because the world told us to do it that way. Let's do it God's way because the end result is so much better than anything the world could offer us. I love you all very much. I bless you all in Jesus' name, and I'll see you in the next video.